Good morning, dear friends. Grace to you and peace on this Sabbath day as we gather to worship the Lord, our God, with heart, mind, soul, and strength. Before we begin our service this morning, let me make just a few announcements. This evening, we will have one more evening service at six o'clock, hopefully this week in the park. We've had so many occasions this summer, we've had rain, we've had to meet indoors, but it promises to be a lovely day. So join us at six o'clock. We're going to be talking about the prodigal son. There will be a memorial service next Saturday for Fred Smith. That's at 11.30 in the morning. If you knew Fred, I would invite you to join the, his family and the fellowship of his faith family for that service. And of course, we lift up in our prayers this day the family of Susan Stewart. Sue's memorial service was yesterday here at the church. Our church office will be closed on Monday of this week as our office administrator is on vacation, but it will be opened regular hours Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I believe that's it for the announcements this morning, so let us go on with our call to worship. As the sun rises in the morning, as the cool breeze ushers in the evening, as the heat of the noonday sun spreads across the land, God is present with us. God brings us peace. God teaches us patience. Come, let us worship God. Prayer of Invocation. God of light and truth, you are beyond our grasp or conceiving. Before the brightness of your presence, the angels veil their faces. With lowly reverence and adorning love, we acclaim your glory and sing your praise. For you have shown us your truth and love in Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Well, I hope you enjoyed our opening hymn this morning, When Morning Gilds the Skies. We turn now to our opportunity to confess our sins to the Lord, to seek God's repentant favor in, in the form of grace, to open ourselves up to the power of the Holy Spirit, which heals us and soothes us and comforts us. I would invite you then to join with me in a time of prayer as we offer up our prayer of confession to the Lord. Let us pray. 
Merciful God, we confess that we have not always followed your way. You are always faithful to us, yet we pursue our own desires. You are generous beyond measure, yet we jealously hoard your gifts. You are persistent in mercy and irresistible in grace, yet we lack the patience to enjoy and share your blessings. Forgive us, God of grace. Help us to comprehend the height and depth and breadth of your great love for all. We pray this through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And now, Lord, we lift to you our silent prayers of confession, trusting that in your mercy you do hear and forgive. Amen. We are a people of God, a people of faith. Christ invites us to come with repentant hearts and assures us of God's unending love and faithfulness. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. If you have any children with you in the home this morning, I would invite them to come and sit with me for a few moments. I had an interesting thing happen this week. My husband and I moved into a new house and it has a different kind of refrigerator that I've had in the past. My last refrigerator had an automatic ice maker in it. Oh, and that thing was so cool. Whenever I was thirsty, I could just push a little lever and all these ice cubes came out and push another one. The water came out, it was wonderful. Well, my new refrigerator doesn't have any of that. And because we, we had an ice maker in the old refrigerator, we didn't have any ice cube trays. So I had to go out and buy some and get into the habit again of making ice for my drinks because I really like my drinks cold, especially things like water and iced tea. The thing of it is though, because I have to make my own ice cubes now, I have to be patient. If I put an ice cube tray in the freezer, I can't expect that in five minutes, 10 minutes, even an hour, that those ice cubes are gonna be solid. Even in an hour, it's still just the edges that are solid and inside it's all water. Maybe cold water, but it's still water. I've had to learn to be patient again. God advises us to spend our lives trying to be patient. And there are a lot of things in life it's hard to be patient for. You know, I, I, even as an adult, Christmas is such a special holiday that I can tend to get impatient for it, wanting it to come. The same with birthdays and anniversaries and any kind of a special event in the life of family makes us somewhat impatient. And while that's a normal thing, those of us who learn how to be patient tend to be happier people because we're not always wired. Instead, we take things in stride and we feel good because we know that God will give us what it takes to get through till that event, that happening, that moment that we await. So I encourage you in the week ahead, when you find yourself getting impatient with someone or something, take a deep breath. Ask God for strength to make you patient and then try really hard to say, I can do this. I can be patient. If we make it a point to be patient, it will happen, I promise you, and life will be much smoother. Thank you for joining me this morning. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord God, for the gift of children and also for the gift of patience. Help us, Lord, to learn to control our emotions so that we can actually be patient and wait well for the blessings of life. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Prayer of Preparation for the Word God of mercy, you promised never to break your covenant with us. Amid all the changing words of our generation, Speak your eternal word that does not change. Then may we respond to your gracious promise with faithful and obedient lives. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. The Old Testament lesson today is Psalms 
37, 1 through 7, A. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. He will make your vindication shine like the light and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, George has shared with you today our psalm, Psalm 37. I will be sharing the gospel lesson this morning, which comes to us from the eighth chapter of Luke's gospel, verses 11 through 15. You will remember that we are doing a sermon series on the fruits of the Spirit. Today's fruit is patience. Luke 8. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones on the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. The ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe only for a while and in a time of testing fall away. As for what fell among the thorns, these are the ones who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. But as for that and the good soil, these are the ones who, when they hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patient endurance. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, may we remember that you have gifted us with the Holy Spirit, and by this same Spirit, we come to know you and to love you, and we come to share that love through the blessings of your Spirit as they are fulfilled in the gracious fruits the Spirit provides. In the name of Christ we pray. And now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be found acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. One thing I've learned through the years is that we Americans really seem to love our cliches, even cliches about faith. Having simple phrases at the ready whenever we are faced with some kind of challenge has become a sort of social norm for responding to times of anxiety. When our neighbor, for instance, tells us of an unwanted job transfer, we fish for something to say quickly and pulling out of our bag of verbal chestnuts, we may come up with something like, well, look on the bright side. Everything happens for a reason. You'll be fine. Of course, in that situation, the worst that may happen is that your neighbor gets annoyed with you and doesn't invite you to their going away party. But when things like this are said quickly in a dire situation, rather than actually taking the time to listen to the concerns of another, it can do more harm than good. How would the families of those killed in the Surf City condo collapse have felt if their grief was dismissed with that rather trite phrase. When we say that everything happens for a reason, we are implying that God somehow willed this awful thing to happen and that it's all part of God's greater plan for humanity. But what kind of God is that? God does have a plan for us. Yes, 
As God says through the prophet Jeremiah, for surely I know the plans I have for you, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. God has plans for us, good plans, but plans for our welfare, not plans for tragedy or great harm. God desires for us a future that is ripe with hope. So when in the midst of tragedy, while sin may seem to have won the war, or when a natural disaster or an illness or a military coup has taken away all those whispers of hope, we have to trust that God is not causing our suffering, but is with us through our times of trial. We have to trust that God can take the awful things that happen in life and transform them into something with meaning, relevance, and hope. This shift from spilling out cliches in the midst of some obvious pain to standing alongside a grieving friend or neighbor who finds themselves in a spiritual desert is an important shift. It's what we do as Christians, sharing the knowledge of God's sustaining presence with those who wonder why. Why, Lord? Why did my loved one have to die? Why did I get cancer? Why do my prayers go unanswered? But such a shift from cliches to true compassion takes effort and it takes patience, especially since people are not relieved of their grief overnight. And having the patience to endure another's pain until they are healed is actually quite difficult. Cognitive scientists tell us that our natural default as human beings is that of impatience rather than patience. And why is that? Because in our hunter-gatherer days, it was impatience that kept us safe and kept us fed. Our impatience moved us from place to place, from hunting one thing to another, in order that we would avoid danger and be sustained by nourishment. Impatience then was a survival emotion that motivated human beings to move up to higher ground, to safer plains, to calmer waters, to soothing seas. You get the idea. Well, sitting with a grieving widow or a father who's lost a son is not soothing, nor is it safe or calm. We might be faced with shock, denial, pain, even anger which is why we have that tendency to reach again for some kind of time-worn phrase that'll get us out of such a painful situation as quickly as possible. But as I've already said, such phrases can really do harm. As someone who has faced death on two different occasions, I can, I can tell you that there were many occasions when people with all good intent said to me, Rhonda, don't worry. God will never give you any more than you can handle. To which I would reply, friend, God did not give me cancer. God did not put an improperly vented stove in a church manse so that I would be overcome by carbon monoxide fumes. No. God gave me the resilience I needed to face my battle with cancer straight on. And God gave me the gift of a holy miracle that allowed me to turn off the oven before passing out for a second time. God was in those moments. Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. God didn't cause my ill health, nor did God cause those times of grieving as a result of my questions. God also does not cause you to have times of illness, grief, struggle, or even issues at home. God doesn't give us pain. God gives us hope. 
and a holy arsenal of spiritual tools to help us stand strong in the midst of all that pain. Standing strong and doing the hard work of dealing with life's setbacks requires of us some endurance, both on the part of the injured and on the part of the one giving care to the injured. Of course, as it would be far easier to put that responsibility for caregiving onto the shoulders of someone else, like God, rather than consistently, painstakingly, lovingly, gently walking with a grieving friend or an ill neighbor. We are prone to cut and run. After all, as N.T. Wright has said, we applaud patience, but prefer it to be a, a virtue that others possess. Patience is a virtue. That is another one of those platitudes that can hurt as much as it heals especially when anxiety levels are high and the need to have some measure of control in a situation is palpable. Patience can be an elusive creature in challenging situations. But patience is a gift we receive from the hand of God, a spiritual fruit that we can supply to others as we seek to make a difference in fretful times. Max Lucado once wrote, patience is more than a virtue for long lines and slow waiters. Patience is the red carpet upon which God's grace ap approaches us. A red carpet, I would add, which we can then extend to others on Christ's behalf. But if impatience is our default, then how do we work at developing patience as human beings? After all, in this day of instant downloads, real-time messaging, next-day deliveries, and curbside fast food, the pace of our lives has quickened so much that it can be hard for us to settle down and settle in. Leadership coach Jennifer Riggs offers five tips for handling impatience. Now, I'm going to modify them a bit for, for a Christian audience, but Jennifer suggests that there are five helpful steps that we can take to stop impatience from leading us down that rabbit hole of reactive behavior. Behavior like avoidance, frustration, and anger. First, she suggests that we take notice Take notice of ourselves and of the other people around us. Learning to be aware of our situation and the expectations we have of ourselves and those others. Awareness, she says, is the first step in a process of moving from impatience to patience, from anger to stillness, from frustration to compassion. And that leads us to a second tip for handling impatience, that of compassion, and of understanding that those others around us probably don't have the same expectations or priorities that we do. For example, she says, in the case of my children, they really aren't trying to frustrate me or always be late. They're just focused on what they're doing in the moment which is probably why Irish comedian Deirdre O'Kane says, the notion that patience is a virtue is something you don't fully appreciate until you're a parent. You need endless patience with little ones. So a cliche turned gold mine. Riggs' third tip is to focus on what we can control in life and then to plan on it. Plan on things taking longer, and scheduling more time when you can. As Christians, we would also say, give those things we can't control over to God. Now that doesn't mean that we throw up our hands in defeat whenever we're faced with challenge or that we walk away from situations that are just plain hard and let God do it all. Rather, it means that we do what we can, as much as we can, 
as best we can, all the while trusting God to be with us through the storms of life, helping us manage the little skirmishes and the big calamities with composure. A fourth tip, Riggs says, take a moment. Notice your impatience and take some deep breaths. If you've ever practiced yoga or mindfulness, you know what it means to take those deep cleansing breaths because those breaths cause us to focus on breathing. Focused breathing is an emotional way of centering ourselves as well as a spiritual way of gaining that center that God provides, which can shift us away from impatience in the moment to a place of awareness and then rest and then peace. Of course, if time allows, taking a few moments to pray or to meditate is also a very good way to interrupt the spiral of, of impatience. And what's more, making a moment for ourselves each day to add a spiritual practice like prayer can actually help rewire the brain away from the impatience of our hunter-gatherer days toward a place of inner well-being and peace. Finally, the fifth tip is this. Put greater time and distance between you and your favorite fast social media outlet or your phone. Riggs says, if you have a habit of checking your texts the second you hear the notification or checking your email or Facebook or Twitter too frequently, try extending the wait period. Again, this will help slow our pace as we give ourselves permission to look at our phone, our tablet, or our computer far less frequently. When the Apostle Paul tells the Galatians to be a, pr a fruitful people, rather, a fruitful people, by sharing the gifts of the Spirit, one of which is patience. He is encouraging the church to love one another in Christ's name and to do so with hope and encouragement. Paul lists nine different expressions of the Spirit which grow into a connected whole. At the center of this, this universal essence, this holy fruit, is love. Love is the blossom from which all else grows. Love is where the fruit of the Spirit begins. Without love, there is no fruit. Just as you won't have cherries without cherry blossoms or apples without apple blossoms, the fruit of the Spirit will not blossom and grow without love. This love is a gift from God that we receive at our birth and bear in our souls. This gift is not something to be hoarded, but one to be shared. This gift, this love that is planted in us by God like a sower planting seed is then nourished by Christ and tended to by the Spirit so that it may grow to beautiful fruition in us that we might be Christians, unique, and a community of faith that is also unique, but bound together by love. In Paul's wisdom, joy is love rejoicing. Peace is love reconciling. And patience is love embracing others and enduring our struggles with care. It's love, yes. Patience is love that is compassionate. It's love that makes room and space and time for growth. It's a gift that is given without the thought of return and yet a gift that makes us thankful for another's patient love when it's offered. When Paul highlights the spiritual fruit of patience, he speaks in terms of developing a long fuse. 
He does so as a reminder that we are, after all, only human, and sometimes we have a short fuse, which can cause harm to those around us. To his point, we know that we do sometimes have a short fuse, and yet that is no excuse for us to act out. We can and we shall control our behavior as hard as it may seem in a given moment. This is as true behind a steering wheel as it is at the dinner table. Thousands of auto accidents happen every year, most often due to either distracted driving or impatience. And when death is involved in those accidents, more often than not, the driver who causes the accident walks away while the other driver and any passengers are killed. According to AAA, in 2017 alone, Drivers who blew through red lights killed nearly 1,000 people. And studies have shown that one of the chief reasons for running red lights is impatience. Friends, this is behavior that we can change if we choose to do so. And of course, the sooner the better. Impatience may be our default as human beings, but it's more likely to harm us in the end than it is to protect us. Our calling then as Christians is to foster faith, hope, and awareness by growing that blossom of love within us as we patiently bear the fruit of the Spirit as a gift to the world. Friends, may we love one another as Christ loves us offering a non-anxious presence in an all-too-anxious world. In Christ's name, amen. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for the gift of your word to us this morning. We pray that you would help us become a more patient people, that you would help us find ways to dial back our anxiety, our tension, our anger, and present ourselves to the world in a much more patient and peaceful manner. Help us, Lord, to learn how to take those deep breaths, how to take time and make time for the events of life so that we don't get caught up in a rush, but instead savor the sweetness of your spirit that offers us the gift of peace. In the name of Christ our Lord, we do pray. Amen. It is right on the Sabbath morning that we offer up our prayers to the Lord, remembering those in need, giving thanks for wonderful opportunities in life, remembering to share ourselves to God and others with love, and to patiently, not hurriedly, walk through the prayer, stressing the gift of a holy love. Let us pray. Gracious and life-giving God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the saints through the years who have taught us the ways of Christ, the teachings of Christ, the manner of Christ, and have encouraged us to live into our calling to be the faithful and make disciples in the name of our Lord. We thank you also for our personal ancestors in the faith, many of whom stood by us as we were baptized, who watched with joy and pleasure as we were confirmed, many of whom served as mentors for us, sponsors in the faith, guiding us to that place where, as adults, we could make a decision for ourselves to claim you as Lord and Savior. We also thank you for the saints alive this day who continue to abide in the body of Christ and live faith-filled lives for the sake of your Son. Lord, we pray to you for this church, 
and for all the churches throughout the world that serve in your name and offer up the gift of discipleship, mission, service, and prayer on behalf of those whom you call beloved. We remember to you this day, dear Lord, those who struggle in some manner. We lift to you the people of Afghanistan as the likelihood becomes quite evident that the nation will become under the control of the Taliban once again. We pray for all of those English language interpreters, dear Lord, who are trying to get out of the country before they are arrested tried and found guilty by the Taliban for what would be considered treason, even though they felt that their calling was to shine a light on the evil that was and is the Taliban. We remember to you also the people of modern Europe who are struggling after those massive floods of, of late. We pray to you for those on our west, western shores who have been fighting those massive wildfires over the past couple of weeks. It's amazing for us, dear Lord, here we are on the East Coast, and yet several nights this week we've had air quality alerts. Why? Because the smoke has crossed over thousands of miles from California, Oregon, and Washington to reach these Eastern shores. Lord God, hope, help us to understand our culpability in climate change and make a pact, a covenant with one another and with you to do our best to retrieve the creation that you had in mind. We pray also for the people of Haiti as they undergo a change in leadership. We in our own country know how challenging those transitions can be in a country that is already faced with Poverty, illness, hunger, fear, low wages, fraud. That transition can be even more violent. Be with them, Lord, during this very difficult time. We remember to you those organizations that give of themselves in wonderful ways as angels of mercy to those in need. We remember to you the local food pantry and pray your continued blessing upon it that they will continue to receive donations and offer them out to those who are hungry. We pray to you for a housing organization such as Habitat for Humanity that commits itself to building affordable housing, knowing that people who live in stable, standard housing have a much better life than those who live in constant transition from place to place to place. Lord God, we pray for the leaders of this church that they might continue to lead with energy, intelligence, imagination, and joy. And we pray a special prayer for the elders installed this day, Ken Phelan and B.A. Long. Be with them as they work with the other 16 members of ses session to serve this church well through their leadership. May it be courageous, dear Lord, and may it be fine. We pray all of these things in the name of Christ our Lord, who taught us when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So, dear friends, you've, you've heard the call of the morning. Paul invites us to grow that fruit of the Spirit within us from an early blossom to a full-grown fruit that it might be savored and enjoyed by others. One of those fruit is that of patience. As a people 
We often run short of patience, but we also know that we can control our behavior and make patience much more a part of our lives when we are intentional about it. So go into the day enjoying the beauty of it, celebrating the family around you, lifting up your faith as a part, a strong part of your moral core. And remember that patience is something that doesn't happen by accident. It comes as a result of our decision to be at peace with God and one another and to be that non-anxious presence in a world too often anxious. So go into the world in love, be patient, and now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Creator Lord, and the sustenance of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>